okay guys uh, now we are going to talk about the classification of bacteria we have talked about uh, in previous uh, terms that how we can classify bacteria in different uh, genus and species and all this stuff and what are the techniques we have used but now we are going to look at uh, the modern day approach of classifying bacteria and how we can put th those bacteria classification into a book and in the in a book which is called the Burgess Manual of Systematic Cla Classification in this Burgess Manual of Systematic Classification what we can find we can find the information about all those bacteria which are being discovered which are being identified as, as well as classi classified uh, throughout the time okay so let me take this color for yeah okay I have it okay so <coughs> now let's begin uh, now uh, let's go to talk about it. now in Burgess manual of systematic classification we can find uh, different chapters and different volumes and those volumes are containing those volumes are destined to put the information about a particular type of bacteria so in, in this case in, in the second edition of Burgess manual of systematic classification what we are having we are having volumes uh, volume uh, four five volumes actually in this five uh, volumes we are uh, we are having different types of bacteria okay uh, they are having different types of characteristics now each of this volume is having a general characteristic features and those bacteria which fulfill that general characteristic feature is put on onto that for volume okay so in this five volume the general view is that then the volume one is consisting of the archaeas as well as the deeply branching and phototrophic bacteria. Now, archaea are not considered as bacteria now because archaea are the primitive one. And as we know, if we start the journey from a uh, common or last universal common ancestor, which which we call a Luca, and if we start our journey from Luca, we we, we can uh, have uh, sorry, uh, we have a branch. So let you have to draw a branch from this Luca. Now, one of this branch is creating bacteria another one of this branch uh, still uh, start to evolve and grow and it will grow after some time it will start it will have another universal common ancestor and from this ancestor it, it will branch into two parts one of them produces archaea and the another one produces animals or eukarya sorry not animals eukarya so that is the difference that is how uh, the evolution is coming throughout this t three domains so if you look at the three domains bacteria archaea and eukarya that's how it's done nowadays using different uh, uh, cutting edge technologies like dna technology and all these technologies we, we came to know that this archaea are much more are much more closely related with <coughs> with us are much more related with a uh, eukarya than those bacteria okay now in the volume 2 now in this case in volume 1 we are dealing with this archaea as well as uh, some uh, uh, microorganisms uh, some extremophile microorganisms like archaea okay which love uh, to be in the harsh environments okay now in uh, second part in second volume it we have to deal with the proteobacteria now proteobacteria are separate types of genera because they are consisting of different types of proteobacteria including alpha beta gamma and so on so there are different types of proteobacteria we can find delta epsilon all these different proteobacteria okay and in the volume 3 we are going to talk about the gram positive bacteria but which are having the low gc content now this gc content is really important and nowadays scientists are very very interested on this gc content because this gc content uh, help us to identify between different uh, classif different bacteria and this gc content also helps us to know whether uh, uh, two organisms are related with each other or not whether two organisms uh, are uh, on the same species or not depending upon this GC content and we have talked this before that if two organisms are sharing almost uh, 70 uh, per, uh, th almost sharing the 5 percent difference in the GC content or less than 5 percent difference in the GC content we can put them in the same species if they are varying m uh, in uh, over 10 to 20 percent of the GC content then you can say they are uh, on the same genus but not in the same species okay so that's how we can know by looking at the GC content whether two organisms are uh, interacting related with each other or not okay now in the volume 4 uh, again we are talking about the gram positive bacteria but ha they are having the higher GC content that means uh, the bacteria which denotes the very high amount of GC inside the cell over 60 or 65 percent of G GC uh, inside their DNA 
Okay. In the volume five, we are talking about the plan plank to my cities, uh, as well as the spyro kits, and the spyro kits are different types of genera. And actually, the volume five is made up with a, a kind of hodgepodge volume because uh, <coughs> we we after, we can see that after putting all those bacteria in these four volumes, we still have remain some of the bacteria which which we cannot put in any of these volumes. So they are possessing some different types of features, different types and unique types of features and characteristics. So we need to put them in some volume. So we produce they make the volume five. In the volume five, they put them all so all those unusual categories in the volume 5 okay now let's talk about the volume 1 <coughs> okay in the volume 1 we are uh, we are generally talking about archaea okay among this archaea the one thing we are going to talk about most importantly and which is <laughs> the thermotoga because this is my favorite one thermotoga is a very very important one why because you can see the thermotoga structure of the cell of the thermotoga is quite unusual because if you look at the structure this is uh, this dark black uh, portion of the thermotoga is uh, the cytosolic environment and this is uh, th this part which is surrounding this uh, dark part of the thermotoga is a cell membrane of thermotoga but one thing is very very interesting to look at this picture is that this this outer layer of cell membrane is not at all attached with the cell uh, surface with the, with the cytoplasm surface so it is uh, producing a very very a slight uh, very very important and very much uh, gap or uh, a huge gap in between the cell membrane and the cytosolic environment okay so actually it is like uh, someone where a very very uh, loose uh, uh, cloth onto his show onto his body so it is looking like that so thermotoga structure is really important for that purpose this is a gram negative bacteria this is the rod shaped bacteria as you can see but this is a sheath like structure sheath like envelope of this thermotoga <coughs> which is really important okay which is uh, really exciting in this case too now we can also talk about uh, the dinoflagellates Okay, so uh, this phylum Dinococcus uh, is another important part. Uh, so let me take the color. Okay, now uh, this Dinococcus, as you can see in this picture, this is also interesting structure of the Dinococcus. They, we can find them in this uh, tetrad, this in this uh, four uh, cells are attaching with each other to make a structure like this tetrad structure. Okay, the strain gum positive. Their cell wall is layered and uh, has an outer membrane like the gram negative bacteria. That is quite unusual. They stain gram positive, so that is uh, uh, fine. So if you look at them, we can call them the gram positive. But what what is uh, ex exciting or, uh, or some different or uh, different in inside their cell is that they are having the cell membrane. So normally what happens is because of gram positive cells, we are having uh, two layers. One is the internal cell layer, another one is a peptidoglycan layer, which is quite thick. In this case, they although they stain uh, uh, the gram positive color, uh, the the stain uh, like the gram positive bacteria, but still they are possessing a slightly outer layer, which you can only find in case of gram negative bacteria. So they are having the third layer. Okay, in spite of having this third layer, they stain gram positive. Layer. So that is a very very quite remarkable feature about this Dinococcus. Okay, and you call it the Dinococcus thermus. Because this uh, Dinococcus uh, is uh, normally found in the thermal region, so they are having the optimum temperature slightly higher than the mesophilic bacteria. So you can find them in the hu huge uh, high temperature environments. Now, if we talk about the phylum Chlorophexi, the uh, term uh, which is Chlorophexi, that means they have something to do with chlorophyll and the photosynthesis, and exactly the same that the photos they are photosynthetic sometimes, sometimes non-photosynthetic. In this case, we are talking about the photosynthetic green sulfur bacteria are the example of some of those uh, chloro phylum Chlorophexi, and also there are phylum uh, uh, Chloro Chloro B. This chlorobi or chlorobi, whatever you can say, they are also the green sulfur bacteria. They are not non-sulfur, they are green sulfur bacteria. They are not capable of uh, making uh, food using the, the photosynthesis technology, but they can utilize this uh, H2S. They use this hydrogen sulfide and uh, sulfur uh, as well as hydrogen as an electron source, and they can utilize them. <coughs> 
and they can accumulate sulfur outside the cell by using that so that's why this chloro V is also important because they are utilizing the sulfur uh, utilizing the inorganic matter like hydrogen sulfide to take uh, the source as as a source and utilize them to produce energy inside the cell so that's why this phylum chloro V is also important now let's move on to the phylum cyanobacteria so let's just see yeah Phylum cyanobacteria. The cyanobacteria is a very, very important and mo one of the most remarkable uh, bacteria that we can find because cyanobacteria is uh, is a very, very uh, what you can say. Uh, it's, it's a bless to our civilization because if we utilize cyanobacteria, it can give us many things. Uh, 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 also, cyanobacteria can possess some toxic toxic parts, which you go <laughs> but which, which can be dangerous for us. But still, cyanobacteria are the huge sources of photosynthesis because cyanobacteria are, are produced uh, enormously in, in uh, the ocean environment. And there, the cyanobacteria are green because they are having lots of chlorophyll inside their cells, as you can see in this picture, lot and lots of chlorophylls inside their cell they are ha not only having the chlorophyll a they are also having different uh, uh, chromogens like phycobilin and phycoerythrin and all different different types of chromogens like blue color red color particles inside their cell and they are producing rapidly food they are they are going through all those steps of photosynthesis and producing food and producing energy for them now uh, one thing uh, uh, very important about the cyanobacteria is that these are the first type of bacteria which start to produce food which start to go through this uh, photosynthesis pathway and start to produce food so in the evolutionary history if you think about uh, from from a, think about the journey from non food from from uh, nothing towards the production of food towards the photosynthesis process these are the first type of bacteria these are the first choice of the environment who, who start to produce food who start to go through the new path of producing food using the energy of sun so that's why they are really really important and not only that the cyanobacteria can also fix nitrogen the cyanobacteria can also fix nitrogen because they can take nitrogen from the environment they can utilize this nitrogen they can pr incorporate this nitrogen first of all they are, they are taking this nitrogen as you can see in this picture and they produce the ammonia or the inorganic materials like that and then this ammonia or ammonium compounds are, can be incorporated in to make uh, the amino acid which is glutamine in this case so they incorporate this ammonia into the glutamine and after making this amino acid the, the nearby cells can take this amino acid from these cells so they can do this now the cyanobacteria can be found in different uh, shapes and size and different orientation inside the cell we can find them as a colony a mixture of cyanobacteria attached with each other we can find them uh, separately scattered uh, into the environment we can also uh, look at them they can be circular in nature like that uh, or they can be oval shaped like that they can also also be fibril uh, fibril structure like that okay so so whatever we are looking at they are having uh, we can also uh, having the cyanobacteria which are having the specialized cells uh, we can also having the cyanobacteria which are not having the specialized cell so most of the time when the cyanobacteria have the specialized cell they can produce two different types of specialized cells one is called <coughs> Uh, actually I forget the name of that but one type of cell uh, is uh, so much durable in the harsh environment or the environment of stress they pr they act like a spores uh, or, or, or of uh, for the bacteria they can stay for a long time on the environment when the environmental situations turn to their favor they can germinate and produce new cells and you can also find another specialized cells that you can see here which is called a heterocyst now heterocyst is a specialized compartment inside the cyanobacteria which start to uptake this nitrogen convert them into ammonia and incorporate them into uh, this um, uh, in, into this amino acid and thus by uh, by utilizing the energy from the nearby cells which are the normal cells or the vegetative cell this heterocyst cell can utilize them and incorporate the nitrogen into the cell and and give this nitrogenous compounds give this am, uh, give this uh, amino acid to the nearby cells and in turn it can take the energy and carbon dioxide from the outside cells so these are the arrangement of work and very very superior quality work we can see inside the this cells of cyanobacteria the arrangement of different types of of cell and specialized types of cell to do different types of works to do different specialized works that is a really really very uh, important thing and very uh, updated thing okay I must say okay if you know uh, you want to know about the phylum cyanobacteria you can turn on to uh, the cyanobacteria uh, uh, turn on to uh, my discussion about cyanobacteria I have a separate video about cyanobacteria you can look at there now let us talk about the uh, volume 2 
of uh, this uh, Burgess manual of uh, taxonomy and in this case in the phylum 2 it is uh, the whole phylum is de devoted to the proteobacteria because proteobacteria are different types they are uh, they are deserving uh, this this volume because they are having different varieties of uh, their food habits different varieties of their mortality purpose as well as uh, their different characteristics so uh, depending upon these different characteristics and food habits and all these things we divide them in different parts we call them the alpha bacteria pro beta proteobacteria gamma proteobacteria delta proteobacteria epsilon pro epsilon proteobacteria as well as the zeta proteobacteria okay so you cannot memorize all this uh, feature of this different types of proteobacteria so don't try to memorize but the important thing i must tell you about the epsilon proteobacteria and because uh, they are having some important uh, members of this proteobacteria family we, we need to know is the campylobacter as well as the helicobacter pylori now you can find this helicobacter pylori present inside your uh, present inside your stomach uh, uh, they can actually survive the acid stress that is secreted by the acid that is secreted by your uh, stomach cells they can they can survive the HCL or concentrated HCL inside the stomach. So they are having some different technology to survive them. So that is why the Helicobacter is a very very important region of research in uh, which is getting by day by day. So we need to talk about that. So they, they belongs to the epsilon uh, or epsilon proteobacteria phylum and they are having the gram negative in nature they are rods uh, which can be straight uh, also can be carved or helical so this is the basic uh, feature of that okay and most of the proteobacteria as you can see some of them are uh, what you can say uh, oligotrophic some of them are chemo organotrophic uh, so, but very few of them are what we can say the phototrophic bacteria. So, most of the time they depend upon the organic materials or the chemical materials for the energy source. So, that is an important part about that. And we are also talking about the zeta proteobacteria, which are currently composed of only one organism. So, this is totally new in, in the Burgess manual. The marine ion oxidizing bacterium is on this zeta bacterium. So, these are the ion oxidizing bacteria. So, we find the bacteria that can oxidize ion. ion on. So, example is Mary Profundus. Mary Profundus is an example of this kind of bacteria. This is the only one bacteria which is present in the zeta proteobacteria phylum. Okay. Now let's move on uh, to the more detail. If we talk about uh, the proteobacteria, some of the proteobacteria in detail, then we can must talk about this uh, rhodospirillum uh, pro bacteria, uh, which is belonging to the purple phototrophic bacteria. So purple sulfur bacteria as well as the non-purple sulfur bacteria. We have actually heard this name a couple of times, but don't know what, what they are actually doing. So actually purple sulfur bacteria, uh, which are utilizing the sulfide. Now one thing I, I must tell you to go uh, further about this topic is that when when we talk about the sulfur bacteria that means they must uh, utilize the H2S as an electron donor so as well as if it is not H2S definitely it, it, it has to be hydrogen or it has to be the sulfur uh, as, uh, as, uh, as an atom okay so it, they utilize this uh, sulfur dioxide or sulfide uh, whatever type of sulfide as an electron donor for CO2 reduction in photosynthesis so that is the basic part so they are also photosynthetic bacteria as we know in case of photosynthesis we need to have electron donor in general terms what we use what normal uh, trees use we are using they are using the hydro uh, hydrogen oxide or water H2O in normal situation they utilize this as an electron donor uh, during this photosynthetic pathway but in this case uh, in the purple sulfur bacteria they are utilizing hydrogen sulfide instead of uh, water as the electron donor or they can also they may also use uh, only the elementary sulfur or they can use the hydrogen as the electron donor but most of the time they are utilizing the hydrogen sulfide as the electron drone donor okay example is the gamma proteobacteria so gamma proteobacteria are on the purple sulfur bacteria okay and <coughs> if you look at the non pulper sulfur bacteria then alpha or beta proteobacteria are put into this uh, purple non sulfur bacteria so they are purple but non sulfur bacteria that means they are non utilizing the uh, uh, hydrogen sulfide they are typically toxic to most purple non sulfur bacteria so they are not using any hydrogen sulfide in those case so okay so in 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 uh, in turn they are utilizing elementary sulfur for uh, as the electron donor instead of the hydrogen sulfide because in case of this purple non sulfur bacteria the hydrogen sulfide the concentration above 1 to 3 millimolar of hydrogen sulfide is toxic for their cell okay 
so if we, if we look at their nutritionality their nutritionality is so much diversified and they can fix nitrogen in, in some cases the example is the rhodospirillum as you can see here so this is the example of purple non sulfur bacteria so remember one thing if you talk about the sulfur bacteria they must utilize the hydrogen sulfide or the elementary sulfur as an electron donor during the photosynthetic pathway to reduce the carbon dioxide and we uh, <coughs> and if we talk about the purple uh, now if we talk about the purple sulfur bacteria that means they are utilizing the H2S as the electron donor if we talking about the purple non sulfur bacteria i repeat non sulfur bacteria uh, they are uh, if, uh, they are not using the hydrogen sulfide instead of that they are using the elementary sulfur because in their cell the hydrogen sulfide uh, pretend to be toxic okay now let's move on now if we talk about the nitrifying bacteria they are also put uh, inside this uh, proteobacteria genera so we are talking about the nitrifying bacteria so among these nitrifying bacteria we can also find the ammonia and nitrite oxidizers so when you mean by nitrifying bacteria that means the bacteria which can utilize the nitrogenous compounds like ammonia which is nh4 like uh, like nitrite no2 or nitrate whatever uh, they can find and convert these materials into nitrogen so we call them the nitrifying bacteria okay so in this case uh, uh, we can find here uh, in, in among uh, uh, that belong to the alpha beta gamma and delta type of proteobacteria they can be the nitrifying bacteria okay some of them are ammonia oxidizing bacteria so they can oxidize this ammonia and thus they produce the nitric oxides as a result of their uh, after uh, several steps they will produce the nitrogen out of it they are also having the nitrite oxidizing bacteria uh, which uh, oxidizes the nitrite and nitrate then finally produce uh, this nitrogenous compound and sometimes they produce a nitrogen free nitrogen which will uh, be released into the environment and sometimes they are not producing the common uh, the free nitrogen they produce nitrite and nitrate and uh, this nitrate can be circulated inside the cell and finally they are converted into nitrogen and released outside the cell into the environment okay so the example is nitrobacter so whatever the nitrifying bacteria the example is nitrobacter so this is very very easy to mem remember and uh, this is the nitrobacter winogradsky now winogradsky you, you have heard the name of winogradsky because winogradsky is a very famous for its co for its column so we can utilize the winogradsky column to cultivate different types of bacteria uh, in in uh, utilizing the different area of soil uh, okay different area or layer of soil now let us talk about the sulfur and iron oxidizing bacteria we have talked about the sulfur uh, purple sulfur bacteria and purple non sulfur bacteria we have talked about uh, uh, the in in previous case we have talked about the nitrifying bacteria so as you can see in the proteobacteria genera they are so much diversifying they are very very much uh, versatile in nature so there are many type of microorganisms present inside them uh, that that actually that phylum and they can possess different features actually so in this case we are talking about the sulfur and iron oxidizing so that means uh, the bacteria which can oxidize sulfur uh, which can also oxidize the uh, oxidize the iron we have previously seen the iron oxidizing bacteria and uh, which you can find in uh, the zeta proteobacteria uh, general we have talked about before okay now if you look about that the grow uh, this kind of sulfur and iron oxidizing bacteria normally grow chemolithotropically that's why we are talking about the oxidization of those uh, materials because this kind of bacteria also depend on this chemical for their nutrition for for their nutritional purposes okay so they utilizes uh, the sulfur compounds they reduce this sulfur sulfur com compounds okay now thiobacillus is an example of this you can see thiobacillus or thiobacillus whatever you like now thiobacillus and related genera contain several gram negative rod shaped back, uh, beta proteobacteria okay so thiobacillus is a type of beta proteobacteria and uh, they are having the gram negative in nature and they are also rod shaped so most of these proteobacteria are rod shaped and gram negative in nature now they are electron donors and in this case the electron donors are hydrogen sulfide or elementary sulfur and thiosulfide so these are the elements which will provide them the electron for their purposes okay and you can also having the acromatium acromatium is another important thing you can see the picture inside the acromatium cell you can find actually the bulges of uh, region bulged regions like that as you can see here these are the bulge regions the specific gamma proteobacteria so ac ac acromatium is a gamma proteobacteria okay the cells of acromatium store sulfur internally 
so these are the storage vesicles of sulfur as you can see in, in this case they can also store calcite which is CaCO3 or calcium carbonate well, we can also say that and also possibly as a carbon source in the form of CO2 for autotrophic growth so this is a very very unique thing about the acromatium is that they are not only uh, not only storing the sulfur materials uh, internally but also they are storing the calcite which is called the calcium carbonate as their carbon source so they are having in in, in these uh, vesicles what they are having they are having CaCO3 as well as they are having H2S or uh, sulfur components inside that so so they are utilizing these components in the in the future times and produce energy for that so these are the type of bacteria which is slightly doing the work differently because in normal other type of bacteria they uh, they grow on this calcite or hydrogen sulfide to utilize them as the electron donor but in this acromation they generally do not go on that they eat these things they may put inside the vesicle inside the cell when they need it they utilize the, uh, this kind of thing from their cell itself okay so that's a very clever procedure now we are talking about the hydrogen oxidizing bacteria this is also uh, inside this proteobacteria family so hydrogen uh, they utilizes the hydrogen as the sole electron donor and oxygen as the sole electron acceptor in their energy metabolism that's why we call the hydrogen oxidizing bacteria so hydrogen as an electron donor and oxygen as an electron acceptor in this case so uh, some of the alpha beta and gamma proteobacteria members uh, can be put inside this family they have one or more hydrogenase enzymes definitely they need to have different hydrogenase enzymes for that purposes so they are having the hydrogenase enzymes to bind hydrogen and produce ATP out of it and it also includes the uh, carboxy uh, carboxydotrophic uh, bacteria now this carboxydotrophic bacteria which oxidizes the carbo carbon monoxide so that is another important term so what happens in this case we are having the hydrogen as a sole uh, electron donor and oxygen as a sole electron acceptor this is the acceptor and this is the donor that is the difference now electron is removed and electron can be traveled into this oxygen oxygen will take this electron and can be uh, so this is uh, <laughs> Uh, during their metabolism course uh, they can uh, transfer this electron throughout the place okay so so we are ha we are talking about the carboxydotrophic bacteria which oxidizes the carbon monoxide so there are bacteria which can oxidize this carbon monoxide uh, the bacteria are called the carboxydotrophic bacteria that means they, they they just grow on this carbon monoxide so that is a very very important thing to know because the bacteria which can go on the carbon monoxide to oxidize them to finally produce uh, CO2 out of it which is really really important because sometimes carbon monoxide is even mm, uh, even worse than this carbon dioxide okay so we can utilize this kind of bacteria inside the cell treatment to convert this carbon monoxide into carbon dioxide then utilize uh, then then release this carbon dioxide into the environment so you can utilize this so by looking at the features the new and new features about this bacterial cells and the bacterial colonies we can actually design different experiments we can design different products which will help our human race in uh, very much okay so that's why these are very important thing that's why you need to study a lot about the features of the bacteria and that can be provided by this uh, great Burgess manual of taxonomy because this Burgess manual is not only helping us to learn the type of uh, bacteria uh, but also if there is a new invention on uh, sorry new new uh, discovery of a bacteria then you can look at this bacteria and can classify it you can put it uh, into this Burgess manual and that's how we can actually make an encyclopedia of bacteria so whatever whenever we can find it we can make an encyclopedia we can look at them and you can think the what are the features of the bacteria what is the general properties of the bacteria which which help us a lot uh, to go through to to understand the bacteria to go through the study as well as to to prevent us from different diseases uh, to utilize these bacterial features to develop different technologies okay now also another and the last type probably uh, we are talking about is uh, the methanotrophs of uh, methanotrophic bacteria. Now, methanotrophic bacteria, uh, methanotrophs, as you can see here, they oxidize methan methane and few other uh, components, as you can see here. They oxidize the methane and compound as the electron. They utilize uh, the one carbon compound as electron donors in energy metabolism as the carbon source. So, if there is methane, so they, they oxidize that methane to carbonic, uh, to organic materials like CH3OH as well as the H. 
HCHO, so aldehyde groups or alcoholic uh, materials. They utilizes that carbon uh, thing uh, or uh, carbon uh, moieties as their electron donor and utilizes them in their energy metabolism steps. So that is a very important thing. Do we call them the methanotrophs because they utilizes the methane. And uh, they are also have the methylotrophs, which are the organisms that can grow using methyl carbon compounds as called the methylotrophs. So you can use the methyl carbon compounds for their growth. So all of these bacteria which are uh, uh, which you call the methanotrophs and methy methylotrophs are utilizing this me methyl group or methyl group associated moieties uh, for, uh, for as an electron donor in their energy metabolism processes. And as you can see this is the process of how they are utilizing this methane into the hydroxyl uh, hydroxyl and methyl uh, alcohol then the uh, then the formic formaldehyde then the formic acid and then carbon dioxide is produced so these are the step of the metabolism processes that ca that is carried out uh, inside those methyl methanotrophs okay so so all of this uh, starting from uh, the different types of uh, nitrogen fixtures or, or photosynthesis bacteria, they are all classified or can be put inside the proteobacteria. So proteobacteria is a large uh, uh, volume, proteobacteria is a large, really it, it need to occupy a large volume, they are much more versatile, much more diversifying and we can find remarkable uh, uniqueness inside this group. So, okay. Now let us talk about the volume 3 of uh, the Burgess manual and it consists of uh, the low gra GC content containing gram positive bacteria. So we have talked about the proteobacteria which are possessing the gram negative nature most of the time but now we are uh, focusing on the gram positive bacteria and in, in this gram positive bacteria we are talking about the uh, bacteria which are having sorry which are having the higher uh, sorry which are having uh, the low, sorry, which are having the low GC content. Okay, as we know, this GC content is really important for uh, denoting or for for knowing who is related to whom. Now, in this case, uh, we talk about the class molecules. They are different. Actually, cutes are are the suffix which are added with this all these different types of uh, classes or what we can find in this Burgess manual. So, I'm not actually. Uh, focusing on this uh, class uh, nature so we have I'm not actually going to talk about the general view I am going to know uh, I'm going to supply the general view of a volume of the Burgess manual and the type of some microorganisms that present in that volume and try to look at the microorganism features look at the features of the microorganism the characteristics of the microorganism possessed by uh, some of the microorganisms into a particular volume so then you can know so if we if we if you know at least one organism from only one volume so so there are five volumes if you able to know able to manage to know that one uh, uh, characteristic of only one microorganisms from each of the volume then at least by looking at this molecules that by thinking at this uh, microorganisms you can correlate the overall uh, uh, feature of that uh, mic uh, of that group actually overall feature of that volume okay now in this part uh, we are talking about the mycoplasma now if you want to know uh, more about mycoplasma just uh, uh, go to uh, my website uh, shomusbiology.com in uh, youtube too you can find the mycoplasma uh, you can find the lecture on the mycoplasma okay so that is totally devoted to the mycoplasma but in this case i am just focusing on the basic characteristic now, if you look at this if you look at this gram positive bacteria as as we can say that gram positive bacteria always uh, <coughs> stain via the uh, via the gram positive nature of staining but in this case mycoplasma is slightly different because this mycoplasma GC content ranges from 23 to 41 percent so it's a very very low GC content so they lack the cell wall uh, in the typical cell wall component so they cannot synthesize the peptidoglycan layers and peptidoglycan precursors and as a result they are penicillin resistant so these are the properties of mycoplasma and this mycoplasma are considered and uh, said to be the, the smallest uh, bacteria uh, which live in planet. This is the smallest bacteria till date which is known. Okay. Now the mycoplasma colony will look like the fried egg as you can see in this picture. So they always looks like this uh, fried egg appearance. 
Now, if we look at the sporulating firmicutes, that means uh, the firmicutes or, or the class of firmicutes, that means the gram uh, positive bacteria, uh, low, low GC content gram positive bacteria, some of them are sporulating. The example is Clostridium and also some Bacillus. Clostridium, most of the time, they are sporulating bacteria. We can find them vigorously inside the soil and they can produce uh, the heat resistant, uh, heat and different. Uh, mechanical stress resistant endospores and they are anaerobes uh, many uh, times okay and they are responsible for most of the food spoilage uh, and uh, they are responsible for many diseases like clostridium tetany is, is an example of tetanus uh, disease and uh, clostridium perfringens is the causative ag agent of food spoilage okay so these are the examples so you uh, another thing very important is that you must remember at least one of the example uh, from each volume Okay, now if we talk about the non sporulating firmicutes, we are talking about the gram positive uh, non sporulating firmicutes like Staphylococcus, which is also a causative agent of disease like Staphylococcus aureus, is an example of food poisoning diseases. And you can also have the Micrococcus and Streptococcus uh, and also Lactobacillus in, in this non sporulating firmicutes. Now, among them, Lactobacillus is very, very uh, industrially favored. Uh, bacteria because lactobacillus is helping us to produce uh, cheese uh, helping us to make cheese uh, from a uh, milk so lactobacillus is widely used in industrial uh, purposes for making different food products using them okay okay so if we look at their characteristics like here you can streptococcus pyogenes uh, is given there so if we look at the streptococcus pyogenes they they are having the characteristic of hemolysis so they can they can lyse uh, the blood agar as you can see here so in this case streptococcus pyogenes also uh, uh, can uh, lysis uh, that via the alpha hemolysis pathway okay so they can uh, they can do this streptococcus pyogenes can uh, do both alpha hemolysis as well as the beta hemolysis so there are different types of uh, hemolysis process as you can see here the the lysis of the blood cell is varying from one to another okay and if you look at the staphylococcus aureus then they are causes the beta hemolysis but not the alpha hemolysis but in case of staphylococcus epidermidis they causes no hemolysis as you can see in this picture as a result of hemolysis the region where the colony grows uh, the red blood cell is ruptured and as a result of that uh, those part uh, is uh, slightly uh, off color off red color okay so that's that then we can see this alpha hemolysis okay so in case of this staphylococcus epidermidis which is a potential pathogen of our uh, of our skin and epiderm epidermal layer uh, which is an opportunistic pathogen that is generally present in our skin uh, or, or uh, epidermal layers uh, can uh, can no longer cause any kind of hemolysis in this case so these are the general examples of that I'm not actually very much focused on this so just memorize this uh, some of them are sporulating some of them are, them are non sporulating and then among the sporulating ones we are having clostridia uh, as well as the bacillus and among the non sporulating we have staphylococcus trip Cryptococcus, Micrococcus, and Lactobacillus. Sarsin is also another example, uh, as, as, as an example. Okay. Now, if we move on to the uh, volume four of Virgil's manual, it is uh, containing the higher GC content gram-positive bacteria. That means the gram-positive bacteria, which is possessing a very high GC rate. So we need to give much more heat to to separate two strands uh, uh, of DNA from each other uh, in case of this kind of bacteria. Okay. Now, these different phylums like actinobacteria. Now, if you want to know more about actinobacteria or actinomycetes, you go on uh, again, you t log into my website, log into my YouTube channel, and look there. You will find this actinobacteria. You will find uh, the characteristic of actinobacteria in much more detail. But again, in this case, I am ju just willing to tell you. Uh, the basic features and this actinobacteria they are containing actinomycetes and as well as other many other type of bacteria now these actinobacteria are producing a filamentous structure sometimes we uh, we sometimes uh, we uh, actually uh, they distinguish like the structure of a fungus like a high field structure and these filamentous colonies of uh, the filamentous uh, growth property of this actinobacteria is a little bit unique rather than other type of bacteria. Now in the colony you can find a white colony, white dot like colony. This colony in middle portion is slightly upward. Okay, so in this black picture, this is uh, in this case you can see here. These are the colony appearances as you can see the many uh, uh, can here. Okay, and you can also have the earth 
ortho vector shows uh, the rod cocker's growth pattern now this is the ortho vector uh, the example this picture is uh, not uh, the picture of actinomycetes this is the picture of ortho vector so let me talk about uh, the picture of uh, actinomycetes first the actinomycetes picture just looks like this so they are having the branched hyphae like this structure so these are the structures so this is if, if this is the agar plate or agar medium some of this colony is just coming out uh, a structure like that uh, and they are embedded into the agar medium somewhat and if you look at the proper colony then you can find at the middle portion of that it is slightly upward and in the both of the sides it, it is just getting down okay so this is called this these filaments are called the axial filaments and and these filaments which is getting uh, inward uh, uh, embedded in in this uh, agar medium is called a substrate filament so they are consisting of the axial as well as the substrate filaments and that is the actual uh, nature of this actinobacteria now this actinobacteria are having uh, very high amount of gc more than 60 to 65 percent amount of gc uh, content inside the dna and they are also possessing uh, the different layers in their cell wall uh, in their mycolic acid and all this thing inside their cell wall and they possess and different types of compound chemical compound which is called the geosmin uh, geosmin you can find all this in uh, my video about uh, the actinomycetes but this geosmin compound is really important because they produce this geosmin and due to the result of this geosmin compound when water heat to this geosmin and it will get divided and as a result of that a different typical smell of the soil is generated when water hit the soil after a longer period of time when the soil was dry so that is uh, due to the presence of this actinobacteria inside the soil we can find a huge amount of actinobacteria in the soil and if you talk about the arthrobacter as an example in this case you can see they are a uh, rod coccus growth pattern that means uh, the, they are they are not at all a rod or not at all coccus so we are talking about rod and coccus mixed up so we are having something like this kind of structure as you can see in this picture so they are rod as well as coccus so we call the rod coccus growth patter pattern in this case okay now uh, if we look about the um, uh, phylum mycobacteria this they are, they are acid first mycobacteria we have also talked about uh, this uh, previous actinomycetes we have we have, we have talked that uh, this actinomycetes sometimes possess mycolic acid in in their uh, peptidoglycan outside their peptidoglycan layer so again in this case this presence of this mycolic acid outside the uh, peptidoglycan layer uh, is very very important to make uh, bacteria acid first because uh, in those bacteria we need to stain them via the acid first mechanism of staining they cannot be stained via uh, the normal usual staining purposes okay and in this case the presence of mycolic acid and other lipid outside the peptidoglycan layer makes this mycobacteria very very uh, vulnerable to the acid first staining and not uh, at all feasible for the other type of staining so what is what do you mean by this acid first staining actually we use the basic food scene dye to uh, stain it and cannot be removed from the cell by acid alcohol tolerant treatment okay so if we treat it via acid or alcohol you cannot remove the stain so you need to go through different procedure for staining it we call it the acid first staining because we utilize the basic food scene dye for staining this kind of mic microorganism because of the presence of the mycolic acid outside the peptidoglycan layer okay so this is the um, uh, important thing about this group 4 that they possess this acid fast type of microorganisms and now let's talk about the last uh, volume of the Burgess manual which consists of planktomycetes as well as the spirochetes the spirochetes is my favorite one among this group because uh, if you again if you need to know more about spirochetes just go uh, look for uh, the video about spirochetes in my website and YouTube channel. You can find it. And <coughs> in the phylum Bacteriodes, as you can see, th they are anaerobic in nature. Sometimes they are microelophilic, and they are gram-negative. They are non-spore forming. Actually, they are non-sporing. This we call it the non-spore forming. And as, as well as sometimes they can be motile or non-motile. Example: If you take the spirochetes, they are motile in nature. They possess a flagella. The type of flagella they are possessing is is quite unusual because this flagella is called the intracellular flagella or or uh, what you can say the periplasmic fl flagella because this flagella is present in the periplasmic space of this bacteria which is connecting both of the ends of the bacteria and using this flagella this bacteria can move from one place to another place they are slightly thin and long structures like fibrils uh, they, are, they are rod shaped structures and they are anaerobic sometimes sometimes uh, uh, some of these uh, phylum uh, 
applying to my mercedes can also be uh, an arabic and sometimes they can be micro arabic but but they are gram negative indeed and they are also uh, so if we look at the planktomycetes now they are unique among all known prokaryotes in uh, in is that uh, that they show extensive cell compartmentalization including some of the case of membrane enclosed nuclear envelope structure so if we look at this cases so so normally what happens if if we go back and look at the structure of this planktomycetes so why we are at all bother about this planktomycetes is because this planktomycetes are supposed to be or said to be the first type of microorganisms which start to produce the eukaryotic type of organisms because if we look at the difference between a prokaryotic or organism or the early organism and an eukaryotic organism so let me take another color so prokaryotic organism as well as an eukaryotic organism so this is an eukaryotic organism and this is a prokaryotic organism the difference is in this prokaryotic organisms they are uh, not having the compartmentalization compartmentalized organelles uh, but in eukaryotic organelles we are having the compartmentalized regions of mitochondria uh, organs like nucleus and all these things all the stuffs inside uh, inside the cell so that is the differing purposes so there must be a journey from the non compartmentalized cell towards the compartmentalized cell and that is uh, uh, that is uh, the evolution of Uh, the prokaryotic cell towards the eukaryotic cell production does the evolution have to be started and there must be a junction point of the evolution where we can find both the uncompartmentalization step as well as the compartmentalization step and that is provided by this planktomycetes that that gap or junction is filled by this planktomycetes so some scientists believe that this planktomycetes are, th are the type of microorganisms that start to to take the leap to go towards the eukaryotic organisms to go towards producing the higher type of organisms okay the higher organization inside the cell and you can see here that inside the cell there are compartmentalized regions like that and you can see in this compartmentalized portion this is the genetic material of that cell that means they are producing this amateur nucleus inside this planktomycetes cell as well as we are having small regions for producing uh, for go through the photosynthesis purposes as you can see here okay so all planktomycetes produce a structure enclosed by a non unit membrane called the peri peri ellulosome so it's a, it's a pyrilulosome as you can see so not peri pyrilulosome this structure contains the nucleoid as you can see in the previous picture it contains ribosomes and other necessary cytoplasmic components so what what uh, they are doing in this case they are actually taking all those necessary parts they are taking all those necessary parts like their genome their uh, the, the lysosomes their ribosomes and the necessary parts and they they take and put them in, in inside this in uh, inside this uh, what you can say the vesicle like structure inside this organelle like or pre organelle like structure and the name of it we have, uh, we have seen in this case is called the Uh, pyrilulosome so pyrilulosome is really really important structure we start uh, the evolutionary journey uh, towards the production of eukaryotic cell from the prokaryotic cell okay and also they they are having the gemata which is the nucleoid itself is surrounded by a nuclear envelope okay so they hypothesize that this lineage was the nature's first experiment with the eukaryotic cell planning so that that can be done because the evidence says us so my mouse is very very bad it is getting bad day by day so i am very much sorry for for my mouse i can't do anything better than that okay anyways uh, so so i can say that this is the nature's first experiment with the eukaryotic cell planning so the nature start to plan to produce the eukaryotic cell from the prokaryotic cell toward the normal cell uh, uh, journey from toward the normal uh, evolution journey and that is provided by uh, the type of bacteria and this is the type of bacteria the planktomycetes is the right type of bacteria which start which which take the leap for starting this journey okay so that is very important thing about the volume 5 one is spirochete another one is the planktomycetes so i hope that's that's going to help you and just just uh, another very very important thing and finally sum up all these things together and finally tell about that is try to not try to mug up all those things because if you try to mug up all those things you never do this that is really really hard because there are lots of name lot of different types of features and all these things so my uh, opinion is that you choose all those volumes and choose only one 
of uh, or each uh, single member of that volume so if, if you choose only one bacteria from each volume and look for their features and go for their features look at their features look at their pictures that is really necessary I'm emphasizing it look at their pictures look at their general properties you can find all, uh, one of all of this group uh, we can find all, one type of microorganisms from all of this group inside my website you can look at them from each genera and you can go through that and you can look at their features and by looking at them you can actually correlate the relation you can actually look for the property or the basic property or the general property of that microorganism general property of that group when the microorganism belongs for example if we look at this uh, spyro kits uh, for from the volume 5 you can look at some pro property because spyro kits are gram negative they are anaerobic they are motile so you can write that uh, among this group 5 uh, we are having gram negative things anaerobic uh, microorganisms as well as motile microorganisms and non spore formers okay so these are the examples so again if I go back into the volume 4 you must talk about the actinobacteria okay because actinobacteria if you know actinobacteria then you can know the volume 4 so this is uh, this is the type of organism we that that I want to focus on okay and if we go back to the volume 3 in the volume 3 I must focus on this mycoplasma because this is very good uh, example of volume 3 and they are also having some unique properties okay so again in the volume 3 uh, they are having the low GC content as well as uh, th th this is having no uh, peptide glycan and all this okay now if you go back to the volume 2 which is the proteobacteria now in, the, in this proteobacteria actually we are having lots of different types of bacterial examples and name and all these things we have ammonia nitrite oxidizers iron oxidizers you have nitrogen fixers and all these things but I personally recommend you to go through and look at the difference between purple bacteria and purple non-sulfur bacteria and I, I personally recommend you to look at the simple features about them okay but in volume 1 I, I want you to look at the cyanobacteria so this is a very very good example which represent the uh, volume 1 which is a cyanobacteria okay so you can look at the cyanobacteria and their features by looking at all these things you can actually uh, you can actually memorize all the stuffs so that will help uh, you to go through and also the thermotoga because uh, the structure and property of thermotoga is important so uh, that is a, a common friendly advice uh, I hope that's gonna help you thank you